Today we are going to be continuing on in our Sermon on the Mount series, and if you have your Bible with you on your phone or whatever, or if you want to follow along, it's Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, and we're going to be wrapping up this very last bit of Matthew chapter 5 together. I'd like to begin with a reading from the Scriptures together. The text says, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the good, the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thus far, the reading of God's Word. You know, this passage that we have just read here is probably contains, I think, the most well-known phrase that is associated with Christianity, and that is the phrase, love your enemies. Now, other religions in the world, yes, do speak about love. You have like the Baha'i faith as well, which talks about love and the importance of it. Yet, looking at all of those things, I would argue that no other faith system in the world so concretizes and so makes real this abstract idea, this concept of love as Christianity does. And we see love actually not just as an intellectual or philosophical problem, but we actually see love lived out in the work and person of Jesus Christ himself, who lived a perfect life for poor lost sinners, dying on the cross for them so that he might give them his atoning death on the cross and give them his perfect life so that out of love he would ransom an entire people for himself to be the bride of Jesus Christ. That is the church that we know today. It's really incredible. And only Christianity has this kind of manifestation, this incarnation of love that is so clear and easy for even a child to understand Jesus Christ. Now, in the culture that we live in, I think there are two major errors that people make when they talk about religions in general. One is that people are quite fond of saying that religion is a major source of world conflicts. Everywhere you have religion, you have problems. Or two, they'll say things like, or all religions are essentially the same. Now, this is very, very common thinking here in our city of Vancouver. You know, there's an outspoken atheist by the name of Richard Dawkins who has often spoken about the danger, he says, of religion. In 1997, after winning the Humanist Award in 96, he actually published an article that was called, Is Science a Religion? And he opens his article with these words, basically, I think a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. And then he says, look at the violent conflicts of uh, Northern Ireland. Look at the violent conflicts of the Middle East, he says, and there you have your proof. Dawkins goes as far as to say in his article that to teach young four-year-olds, either Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, or whatever it is, he says, is ridiculous. In fact, he would say, quote, it is mental child abuse. You know, in the 2012 Reason Rally that he spoke at in Washington, D.C., to a large crowd, Dawkins said, religion makes specific claims about the universe that needs and needs to be challenged, and if necessary, needs to be ridiculed with contempt. He says, mock them, ridicule them to this entire cheering crowd of individuals who support him. You know, I remember one well-known Christian leader, after hearing that, commenting on his words, And he said, noting this, that if Richard Dawkins wanted to preach the same message in Saudi Arabia, he would personally purchase the plane ticket for him. However, he thought that this ticket would probably not be very expensive because he would probably only need a one-way ticket if he wanted to go there. 
See, and everybody in the audience laughed and chuckled at this comment. And I thought about it myself. I'm like, why do we chuckle at a comment like that? Why do we chuckle at this notion of him needing only a one-way ticket? And the answer to that is because deep down inside, we all know you don't have to live very long in this world to realize that it is not true that all religions are the same. Not all religions are the same. Also, I want to say that, see, it's not extremely religious people, per se, that are the source of the world's problems. For example, you can look at the Amish people. You know, the people who drive their buggies, they don't cut their hair, they have simple clothes, they don't have a lot of electricity that they use. If anybody is a Christian extremist, these guys are. But I have never heard of anybody speak about the fear of an Amish terrorist coming out of the group. I actually Googled and looked around for Amish terrorism to see if there were any accounts of it. And the closest thing that I could find was an individual who was arrested for hate crimes, basically taking a pair of scissors and cutting the beards off of fellow Amish people. Like, this is not to say that there is not evil in the Amish community, abuse and other things like that, but that was the only thing I could find which related to terrorism and Amish people. If only terrorism in this world resulted in hair cutting, you know what I mean? The world would be a far safer place. So, you know, the question you have to ask is, why is that so? You know, on the flip side, as to what, it, what, what is it that makes the Amish do what they do? On the flip side, I remember 14 years ago, I was working, and some of you might remember this as well, there was a report that came about a gunman who basically took over an Amish schoolhouse in uh, West Nickel, I think, Pennsylvania. And basically what he did was he uh, took like eight girls, shot eight girls, killing five of them, these, these kids, preteens, you know, very, very young, before committing suicide himself. I remember listening to that story, and some of you might remember this actually, and I was absolutely sickened by it. And it makes me even more sick now as I think about my own children, looking them in the face, what it would be like to know that they were taken hostage and shot. I remember before they died, one of the statements that moved me the most was a report of the oldest girl there named Marion Fisher, 13 years old, who told the gunmen, in the hopes of sparing the other girls, if you're going to shoot anybody, shoot me first. And then her sister, Barbie, 12 years old, got up afterwards and said, then you shoot me second. And another young girl, Anna Mae, stood up and said, then you shoot me next. All right, look at that, and I go, what can drive a young 12-year-old to say something like that, to say, I know you're going to kill us all, but if you only have so many bullets, give me one of the first ones and let me die first. You know, I look at that and I go, do you not hear, though it's not spoken, do you not hear the echoes of the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming out of those little hearts our Jesus who says, greater love has no one than this, than that he lay down his life for his friend. You know, what's even more remarkable about this story is that just hours after the shooting, there was a grieving group of the Amish people. They came to visit Marie Roberts, who was the widow, actually, of the shooter, at her home. And they basically offered her hugs, and they cried for her, and they expressed their deep concern for her family and how they were doing and they told her that they had forgiven her and her, uh, forgiven her husband for what he had done to their children. Days later, despite the fact that they were grieving, just having buried their own children, those little girls, they actually showed up en masse for the gunman's funeral. And even though they disliked having their pictures taken, Marie said this of them, the Amish people turned their backs to the cameras so that the only pictures that could be taken were of them and not of our family. It was amazing to me that they would choose to do that for us. It was one of those moments during the week where my breath was taken away, but not because of evil, but because of the love. It is not a platitude to say that the love and the glory of God shines brightest amidst the backdrop of evil. You, know, you ask the question, is, where does love like that come from? Like, who has that in and of themselves? Could you do that if that was your child with bullet holes in her body? There's only one type of love. 
that deep, that real, that's so grounded in love that's divine itself that can do that for us, and that is the love of God that comes through the work and person of Jesus Christ. A God who understands pain because he watched his own son die to accomplish his, his greater purposes of love, to redeem a, redeem a people for himself. That's the only kind of love in the world. I will give you the ability to do something like that. The love of God is central to our Christian faith. There is no doubt whatsoever of that. You just have to read your Bible. You don't have to read very long. Even if you're a non-Christian, you read the Bible for the first time, you will be amazed at how love literally pours out of the pages of the Scriptures. Jesus said of His disciples, right? Love one another just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. 1 John chapter 4, when he's speaking about love, what is it? Anyone who does not know love does not know God. God is love. Or probably the most famous verse that you'll read, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. There's no question that love is absolutely central to the gospel and to the teachings of Christianity. See, religious extremism per se, is not the problem. It's what your religion believes in and considers to be the highest good. And I dare say that if our world had more true biblical Christian extremists who practice love and are devoted to the supreme ethic of love in the way that the Amish people are, this world truly would be a better place. Now, as we look at our text today, uh, we're going to look at the Scriptures, but, but I also have a number of stories that I want to tell because I, I think it's so important for us to understand today as we look at this text. This is not a concept. Okay? This is love in action, love in true action through Christian lives that stun this world, and in being stunned, they can see our Savior more clearly. I want you to reflect on just one thing as we go through our text today and we listen to these stories, is what does it mean to love? Especially, what does it mean to love those who are our enemies? Okay? Turn with me to verse 43, and we will go through this text a verse at a time. 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, this is the sixth and final you have heard that it was said statement that is given here as Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and it's made, once again, to correct the erroneous teachings of the Pharisees and the other religious leaders of Jesus' day. Now, the problem with this statement is that there is, it's only half right. If you read Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it does clearly say in the law, basically, love your neighbor. But the other part about hate your enemy is not a command found anywhere in the law of God. Nowhere in Scripture are God's people permitted to or commanded to actually hate those who are their enemies. See, it's very easy, you see, for a sin-corrupted heart like ours to basically twist the law of God to make it sort of suit our purposes. That's actually what's been done, right? We're so good at doing this, right, because we have things that we want, but if we could just tweak the law, whether it's the laws of our land or the laws of God, to make it fit what it is we want to do and to justify ourselves, our sin-corrupted hearts love to do this. You know, it, you can see this actually with our coronavirus lockdown, with all the jokes that are being had. I remember one joke that was told of a man who said that, well, since COVID-19 restricts me from having dinner with more than six people, I'm instead this Christmas going to hold a funeral for my turkey, and I will invite 20 people to this funeral gathering. Now, you know, it's just a humorous example to think about, but here's the point. The point is we know how to do this. We know if there are things that we don't like as well, to justify ourselves, we can read the law however we want to make it so that we are still not breaking it, the letter of the law, while breaking the spirit of the law. That's how it works, even with the holy and perfect law of God, bending it. Sin does exactly that. And in this particular case, sin did this by limiting the people whom you were to love. Of course, love your neighbor. I mean, the people who are close to you, who are nice to you as well. But if people don't like you, 
That's not your neighbor. You are permitted to hate them. That's what was being taught at Jesus' time. And it's so in line with the spirit of our age. I don't need to explain that to you for you to understand that that is the law by which many people in our world live by today. They are descendants of the Pharisees. Now, we see this, for example, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, right, in that famous account in which a lawyer gets up to ask Jesus, you know, basically, what, what, what do I need to do, basically, to have eternal life? And Jesus explained to him, love God, love your neighbor. And he says, yeah, I've done all of that. And then Jesus, and, and then just trying to justify himself, he says to Jesus, but, but who is my neighbor, wanting to qualify it? And Jesus, in his typical brilliance as well, in understanding what is going on in the man's heart, tells the story of the Good Samaritan and basically turns the tables on the guy and shows him like this, don't think you are so loving if all you do is love your friends. You know what God expects of you? You want to talk about love? Then talk about a love that loves even its enemies. As this Samaritan, who was an enemy of the Jewish people, bound up the wounds of this man that he found on the side of the road and took care of him, that is what actually God looks favorably on. So don't think you're good. Don't justify yourself. You do not, do not think that you have fully satisfied this command to love your neighbor and justify yourself before God. Now, God is clear, right, in his word. Love your neighbor is not restricted to just a handful of people that we define to be our neighbor. You know what's interesting is that this radical command to love your enemies, though, is actually not explicitly found in the Old Testament. However, the concept actually exists there in the Scriptures. For example, if you read Proverbs 25, verses 21 to 22, it says this, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. You know, you read another account that is similar to this in 2 Kings chapter 6, when the Syrian army is trying to attack an Israelite city. Elisha prays and calls down blindness on them and then leads the army into the city. He prays again, God lifts the blindness, and all of a sudden all these soldiers are in the middle, basically, of their enemy city. And the king of Israel, seeing that the tables have been turned on the enemies, gets all excited, and he tells Elisha, my father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? And Elisha the prophet looks at him and rebukes him and says, no, what you need to do right now is get bread and water and feed them. And so they do that. They actually make a big feast, and they let them go. And it says, from then on, the Syrians stopped raiding the people of Israel. Now, as we think about this and see these examples that are in the law, even though it was not explicit at that time, you can already begin to see the heart of God about this treatment towards enemies that is made clear in the teaching of Jesus later. And now for us, as we're starting to think about this and say, okay, how do I apply this teaching? Uh, who, who then are my neighbors? Who are my enemies? Well, some of you come from persecuted countries, and it's very clear who is your enemy. It's the guy who wants to kill you, actually, or to drag you into jail. Very, very clear. But here in Canada, generally speaking, few people are trying to drag us into jail or trying to kill you for your Christian faith. So you might think, I don't have enemies then. Maybe this doesn't really apply to me. You know, I think Exodus chapter 23 verses 4 to 5 is actually helpful here for us. The text says this, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, okay, your enemy's ox or his donkey, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. You know what's interesting about this passage here is that it helps us understand who fits in the category of enemy. It doesn't just mean a person who wants to take the head, your head off your shoulders, but it could be a person, like it says here, who absolutely just hates you. Like, in the Israelite society, they had laws against murderers. So this is not talking about a neighbor who has a tried attempted murder on you. This is talking about a neighbor that you really disagree with, does not like you, hates you, does not like, you know, your property or what you do on it, and you hate him as well, and you don't like his donkey for the noise it makes or whatever it does. It doesn't matter, and you'd be super happy if that thing just died. But what does the law say here? The law says, no, no. If your enemy's donkey goes astray, you have an obligation to do good to your enemy and to that donkey. That's his. 
See, in this case, it means an enemy should not just be thought of as people who are violent, but people actually who are, don't like you. They're in your social sphere, and for some reason or another, they have a problem in the relationship with you. They're people who are against you. I don't know, it could be people, they might dislike you, they might mistreat you, whether once or repeatedly, they might just be inconsiderate of you, and they irritate you with their tendencies. So you might never have thought of them as your enemies, but they really are in this category of people who hate you or dislike you. And what the law says is here, even for such people, you must do them good. This includes the driver who on Highway 1, when you're trying to get to church and you're already late, cuts you off and gives you the finger. You must do him good. This includes the customs official who gives you a hard time for your English because you don't speak it very well and rolls his eyes at you and treats you very poorly. Or the neighbor as well who constantly complains about you and your family. The co-worker who is always, uh, well, always has a problem with you and the way that you work and seems like they're out to get you. This includes children who dislike you for your newfound faith in Jesus Christ or even family members who as a result of your conversion to Christianity have completely rejected you and thrown you out of the home. The list goes on and on and on. You don't have to think too hard about people that you have relational troubles with. All of those are included in this group. And Jesus says, you need to love them and to pray for them, especially when they persecute you and treat you badly. You know, when I lived in the southern United States, I once had neighbors who were regularly loud in the evening. And I had spoken to them a number of times about this, but one night it was just really loud. It was very late. And I was frustrated. I went up and just hammered loudly on their door, wanting to talk to them again. And this time, the door opened, and the man answered, and he exploded on me. And he says, why are you doing this to me? Is it because I'm black, he says, and the color of my skin? I was taken aback by that. and was kind of stunned and actually kind of mad at first because I'm like, you're accusing me of racism? Have you seen the color of my skin? I'm not exactly in the majority race here either. You know, I'm like, this is ridiculous. But I bit my tongue on that. I said, God, just help me in this moment not to sin against you. You know, just give me love at this moment right now. It's very difficult as well. And listen. And I talked, and I was invited in. It's like past midnight, I think. And I, and I sit there, and I, I begin talking, and I just listen to their story as they told me about how difficult for it was for them in the southern United States being treated the way that they were and how frustrated due to the color of their skin, always feeling like their society and the, their practice and their way of life was looked down on, and they couldn't enjoy even these sort of simple things. And I, as I listened more, my, my heart actually began to feel compassion for them. And I realized that not only had they received racist treatment, but I realized they were really like me because of the treatment I had received down there, being Chinese as well on occasion. You know, at the end, after just listening to him, he actually ended up apologizing to me for his behavior and the words that he had said. And he said, you know, Sam, this happened, he says, because we really haven't been close. We've been here for a year, actually, together, but we haven't been close. And I said to him, you know what, you're right. And I want to apologize for... Uh, just my frustration as well, and this as well, and also my lack of love. You know, I mean, I have really thought very little, actually, of your family as well, and you're right. We should be closer. My heart changed, you know, as I began to see him not as an enemy, right, as, a, as somebody who was out to get me with disturbing things, but actually as a fellow individual who is suffering in a land far away from home. And as I saw him as one of my own, a fellow and broken sinner as well, in need of the redeeming grace of God, and living by that, I realized, yes, let's be close. You know, and, I, and, and it changed, completely changes your perspective on things. How different I think that conversation would have been if I had fallen off the handle and just gone after him and been angry. See, love really does cover over uh, all kinds of sins. And maybe you have that experience as well. You, maybe you have hard neighbors. Maybe you have hard coworkers. Maybe you've lashed out as well with your tongue. Jesus says, love those who hate you and make life difficult for you as well. You know, prayer really is a barometer for our souls. I would simply say, if you can't pray for someone and the only thing you feel about them is frustration and anger to them, you probably actually don't love them. You don't love them in the way that Jesus wants you actually to love them. See, do you have people in your life that are hard to love? Jesus says, love them and pray for them. That is his command. 
But he doesn't just give us this command and say, do this whether you like it or not. Jesus actually supplies the motivation for why we are to do something that is so difficult. And it's found in verse 45. Look with me at verse 45. The text says this. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Here's the point. To hate your enemy is human, but to love them is actually divine. And when you love, you actually demonstrate that you are nothing short of your father's child. You're his children because it is in the heart of God to do good to even those who are evil and those who dislike him. Look, says Jesus, the proof is is in this world. God gives sunlight and he gives rain even to those people who hate him so that they have food to eat every single day. That is his heart of benevolence towards them. That's divine and that's not human. You know, you know what's human? I remember hearing the story actually of a district that would not vote for a particular government. And after that government actually won the vote, they made some plans as they were building their new mass transit system to quietly bypass their district. When the people in the district went to lobby the government to figure out why was our district bypassed, basically it was kind of this under the table. It says, well, if you don't walk with us, well, you can walk to work then. That's how our world operates. You don't vote for me, guess what? Somebody forgot you in the mass transit planning department. Oops, right? That's how we operate, but not God. Now, the Bible is very clear that God does judge his enemies. He does actually make sure that justice will be taken care of at the end of the day, but it's also clear in the Bible that unlike us, God shows his enemies undeniable grace and kindness as well. And you see this in the way that he commands his people to live. He tells those in Israel who are captives in Babylon, to actually seek the good of that city. For in the flourishing of that city, they also will find their own flourishing. That's in Jeremiah. You find also the story of Jonah, who is told to go and preach to the wicked Assyrians in Nineveh, something that Jonah does not want to do whatsoever. And God explains to Jonah that basically, I have compassion on these people who don't even know their left hand for their right hand. See, it's the love of God for even enemies that's why Jesus actually goes to the cross. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says this, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, how much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life? See, God reconciles us while we are enemies. That's the gospel message. See, who loves their enemies so much that they are willing to sacrifice their very own lives to love them? That's divine. You know, Dr. Heath Lambert was a biblical counseling professor who taught at Southern Seminary when I was there a number of years ago. And I remember his story of loving one's enemies, which I found was absolutely amazing. He told the story about how his mother was a drunk. She slept around, and she regularly beat him with mop handles. She starved him, he said, for days without food, shot at him with a gun, and even once tried to drown him. He remembers how he ended up in the foster care system because one day his mother, in her rage, drove him and his brother out into seven inches of snow. He ended up getting frostbite. Now, you think about that, you go like, what kind, how could you do that as a mother to your own child? But the redemption comes in this, that Dr. Lambert talks about how he, at 13 years old, I think he was a young, he was a teenager, a new teenager at that time, heard the gospel message and it changed everything for him. He sincerely thought that every day he could die in his own house at the hands of his mother. So for a gospel to offer him eternal life, he said, absolutely, I am in need of this gospel. And he gave his life to Jesus. And he said the gospel changed everything for him. Although he said that, you have to understand, he said hating his mother for him was as natural as breathing air. He did not even have to think about having hatred for his mother. It was just a part of the way that he lived. But as the gospel began shaping him and changing him, he read Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 18 and the rest of his things and was deeply convicted by the love of God and said, I can't hate my mother. If I do not forgive her, it shows I don't understand the forgiveness that God has given me. I am obligated to love her. And he says for the next 10 years, he began to love his mother and share the gospel with her, even though it was painful for himself. 
He says his mother went from thinking that, from just hating him to now hating him and thinking that he was weird, but he refused actually to give up and kept doing this. One day, he shares that his mother broke and confessed to him why she had hated him all of those years. She told him that actually she had tried to abort him and his twin brother, but the only reason she made the decision not to kill him kill her two boys was because she wanted to trap her boyfriend into marrying her and hoped that the children would help her do so. She explained, that's why I hated you all of those years because I'd never wanted you. But in the preaching of the gospel to her, God broke her. She repented of her sins and she became a Christian. And Heath said that even though she got terminal cancer soon afterwards and died, he saw his mother transformed into a vicious, hateful woman, into a good mother that he was able to have for a few years of his life. And for that, he was absolutely grateful to God. You know that love transforms and covers over a multitude of sins, brothers and sisters? See, do you know how you can show that kind of love and forgiveness to an individual who has had nothing but hatred in their heart towards you? See, only when you realize that you yourself are a recipient of unmerited love, grace, and forgiveness, will you be able to do that for another person without feeling a sense of pride and superiority in your heart, saying, I'm the better man, I'm the bigger person here? No, you will say, I love you because I am unworthy. But a great person showed me grace and kindness, and it is but a small thing I can do to show you grace and kindness compared to the great things that I have received. That's the only thing that will cut away pride from your soul, allow you to love another one. See, this is what is good in God's sight, and it's so opposite what our culture teaches us today. You know, this is what Jesus notes in verses 46 to 47. The text says this, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. I want to be clear here that, first of all, this is not a prohibition on Christians loving one another. This is not saying, okay, Oh, no, if I love another Christian brother, I'm going to lose my reward in heaven as well. I better make sure I'm pretty unkind to my brothers and sisters, but kind to non-Christians. That's not how this works. What Jesus is emphasizing and what he's focusing on here, he's saying is, he's saying it's love, yeah, people who love you as well, but it's not enough just to do that because if that's all you do, you're no different than everybody else in the world. You know, Jesus explains that the Gentiles, whom the Jews thought were basically lawless people and sinners, the Jews thought they were superior to them as well, he's saying, if, if you do that, you Jews, you're actually no better than those people who don't have the law of God. Now, with regards to tax collectors, everybody hated tax collectors because if you were a Jew, you were working for the Romans, who were your enemy, and also tax collectors, as you realize, with the issue, with the case of Zacchaeus, had a habit of not only collecting taxes, but collecting a little more sometimes a lot more than what they were asked to do, and you really had no choice but to pay off. And so they were crooks. And Jesus is saying here, if you love only those who love you, even criminals love those who love them. So what better are you than them? Don't think you're so great. See why Jesus' words sting here. He's saying that, you know what true love is? It's not what you think it is. It's not what your society defines it to be. True love is not falling head over heels for someone, you know, and wanting to marry them. True love actually in God's eyes is the ability to love those who hate you. They don't love you. That's the difference. And if you have any other definition of love like this world does, that's not love in God's standards. It's not what he admires. To love in God's way is to love even those who hate you. Now, there's one more thing that Jesus has to say in verse 48. Look with me at this. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, this is a statement here of God's standard, right? It's a statement here that God says it's perfection. Teleos, right, is the Greek word that's used here. And it's very humbling for us as Christians to think about perfection because it means that not a single one of us is ever going to reach it on this side of eternity. No Christian will ever be able to say, I've made it. 
I'm here at this place where I am now sinless, you know. I, I have nothing more that I need to change in my character. See, I think it's important to us to understand that when Jesus here is speaking about perfection and what to strive for, what he's talking about here is not just outward acts of righteousness, not just the things that you do on the outside. There is great emphasis as you look through this whole Sermon on the Mount, not just on the things you do on the outside, but what's on the inside as well. See, the Pharisees were very concerned with what's on the outside, but Jesus later will rebuke them for being whitewashed tombs who are like dishes that are dirty also on the inside and dead. See, outward actions are important, but they're only a part of God's will for our lives. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will affirm things like don't commit adultery, but he also raises the bar to look at the motivations of the heart and says don't commit lust actually in your heart. He says don't just murder, he says, but he affirms that, don't murder, but he also says, don't be angry as well. Jesus affirms, do righteous things, but he says, make sure your motivations are right, and he says, don't do your acts of righteousness in, before other people in order to be seen by them. You see how Jesus is teaching? It's outward as well as inward. So I think when Jesus is saying, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect or complete or teleos, he doesn't mean achieve sinless perfection on the earth, even though we are to strive to, to be that. The goal of perfection or completion is to have a person whose inner motivations are in line with their outward actions. That's what it means to be perfect or complete in the sight of God. And part of the reason why I think that's actually right when we read this text is because Jesus, when he speaks and condemns the Pharisees in verse 20, says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, the Pharisees were great with outward things. And Jesus says, no, 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 don't dispense with that. He's not saying have a different kind of righteousness. He says, I want you to have a righteousness that exceeds that of them. Go beyond the outward and look to the inward as well. That's what it means to strive for perfection. See, in the kingdom of God, it is not enough to simply do the right things for God while your heart is actually far from Him. It's not that you just serve bread and water to those who hate you, but actually that your heart loves to do that as well. That's actually what Jesus demands. He demands the heart of the Christian. Now, I remember a number of years ago going to hear Gracia Burnham speak at Missions Fest here in downtown Vancouver, and I was moved to tears by her story. Gracia Burnham and her husband, Martin, were basically missionaries in the Philippines, and they were captured by Abu Sayyaf, which is an extremist uh, you know, group, terrorist group. And during that time, they were brutally treated, actually, by their captors. Once she was so angry, she says, with one of her captors named Musab, that she told her husband that she wanted to see him burn in hell. Now, Martin was shocked by this, her husband, and gently spoke to Gracia and said, Gracia, that is what will happen to Musab if he doesn't have a change of heart. But can you imagine witnessing the wrath of God poured out on a person? Even thinking that should make you pray for Musab, not hate him. Gracia said later that Martin's Christ-likeness really touched her in that moment in the jungle as they were running for their lives. And she wrote later these words, It's hard to forgive when you think you're the good guy. When you finally realize that we're all the same and we're all awful sinners before God in great need of forgiveness ourselves, we can start to forgive others. She talked about later about how another one of her captors who was just 14 years old and used to abuse her and throw rocks at her. When he actually got sick, she took it upon herself to actually wash his clothes for him. Now, eventually, she was freed, you know, and there was this big gun battle as well that led to their freedom. But in that last gun battle, her husband was actually shot and killed. And she was devastated by that, thinking that the road to freedom was so close, you know what I mean? But in that moment, her husband, who had survived all those previous encounters, had died. But moved by the love of God, Martin's words, and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Gracia not only prayed for her persecutors, but she eventually went back to the Philippines and found 23 of her captors who had been put in a maximum security prison in Manila. And she worked with others and got them reading the Bible. And in that time, five of them gave their lives to Jesus Christ. It was such an amazing story to listen to, looking at this lady standing up there, 
talking about the love of God and what it had done in breaking her own heart to give her love for even those who had treated her so terribly over the course of those years. Who can do something like that? I would say only those who have been loved by Jesus Christ. Hey, friends, you know, how can you make someone love their enemies? And the truth of the matter is, there is no amount of argumentation in the world that will actually be able to force somebody to love another person. There are not enough laws in this world. No amount of fear of punishment can actually do it. However, if you can show someone that they were once an enemy and received incredible kindness and grace, they will also be able to, from the heart, be able to demonstrate kindness and grace to their enemies. You know, for those of you who are parents here, and you're living with children who often do things that are wrong, what I want to say to you as well is you must teach your children that sin is a serious thing, and it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But there's something else that you must teach your children as well. It's that fear actually will never make anybody love anyone else. You cannot just teach them about the fear of God. You must teach them about the grace and the love of God. See, a person who only knows the law of God will look at a chapter like Exodus 23 and say, okay, I am obligated to bring my donkey's, my neighbor's enemy's donkey back to him. Not because he loves to, but because he's afraid not to. Okay? The law by itself is a terrifying schoolmaster. It can compel outward behavior, but it cannot give you the inward motivation to do, you see, what is right. And this is why you need to teach your children the grace and the gospel of Jesus, the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God. See, only the gospel message explains to us that on the cross, Jesus himself bled and died for the sins of the world. And even his enemies, as they drove the nails into his hands, he did not revile them in return, but he showed us the Father's heart as he prayed for them and said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. You look at Jesus Christ and you say, do you not see the maker of the moon and the stars and the sun above, the maker of all things, standing up there on the cross? with his hands nailed to a piece of wood that he had fashioned himself, not moving because he had to hang there as he endured the wrath of God for all eternity for those who would come to believe in him to pay for their sins. Do you see actually your own name as you think about the cross, as you envision him in your mind? Do you see him hanging there and the blood spilling down with your name written on it so that he could actually save you? Do you see, as those Amish Christians saw, that to forgive is divine, and that to forgive in this way is to walk in the footsteps of our master who has done this for us. Do you see how those Amish Christians shielded the, sh the shooter's wife and her family from the cameras and the media that were surrounding them and making them uncomfortable? Do you see how they put their own bodies there at great personal expense to themselves, something they disliked? because they too saw their master and their Lord shielding them in a far greater way from the wrath of God as he hung there on the cross. How can you give your body to be abused and to protect somebody else? You can do that if you realize that your Lord and your master did the very same thing for you. See, that's why the gospel is so important and why the gospel is magnificent. That's why we love the cross as Christians, and we will never stop speaking about the cross of Jesus Christ, because at the cross, we see the most magnificent display of the love and the justice of God. You know, I love what one of those old hymns has to say when it talks about the grace and love of God. It says, grace and love like mighty rivers flowed incessant from above, and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. I love that song. See, only grace can give you a heart of love. Only grace can make the law for you a pleasure for you to do rather than something you are burdened with. The law by itself can never do that to you. And that's why you must never teach your children just to fear God as a punishment, but you must teach them what they have experienced in the incredible grace and love of God in their own lives so that when they obey, they will say, I do this out of love for my God and Savior who has done all things for me. You know, John Bunyan once wrote this about the law and grace. He said, 
Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet or hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. Do you know how you can soar in this life in terms of loving your enemies while everybody else is stuck on the ground in hate and fighting with each other? You need the gospel. You need the gospel of grace that will give you wings. See, the law can make us bring the donkey back to our enemy, but only the gospel can teach us to make us, can make us love that enemy from the heart and make us a complete, a teleos people whose inside motivations match our outward actions. That is what Jesus wants from us. That is what God wants in terms of complete and perfect people. Are your insides the same as your outsides, brothers and sisters? That is the question. Now, as we wrap this up, I want to say that I know that a number of you maybe have broken relationships in your life, and it causes you a great amount of pain. And after thinking about this, you realize that you actually do have enemies. And here's the truth of this. If you're struggling to forgive and to let go, let me assure you of this, that you can actually let go of the wrong things that people have done to you, and you can forgive, even as those Amish people did, because to forgive is not to forget or to have a miscarriage of justice. If you believe that there truly is a God and that His Son will one day judge the whole world in righteousness, you not taking vengeance upon yourself is not having a miscarriage of justice, but entrusting justice to a perfect God who will ensure that all things will be made right one day. You can let justice go and your need for vengeance because there is a God who will carry it out. What remains then for you is simply to follow then in the footsteps of your master, to look at the person there as not just one who has wronged you, but who is an enemy of God, just like you were, and you can show them love, compassion, and kindness as well, and love them into the kingdom of God. Let the grace of Jesus Christ that flowed into your own soul flow out of you as well, and love them so that they see him for truly who he is. Be free to demonstrate that kind of love to people. That's what it means to be loving. People in, your life need, people in your lives need this. You know, if you're sitting here and you're not a Christian, I just want to ask you, do you know this kind of love? Those of you who are listening online or listening to this later, do you understand that kind of love? Do you realize that the standards of our Canadian culture, that is, love those who love you and hate those who hate you or ignore them, is too low and actually does not reflect the standards of God? It doesn't. Do you realize that actually you're a sinner in desperate need of God's grace and that if you are left to your own devices, you will one day perish and you will meet the judge of all the earth as well and you will realize you fall woefully short of his standards and in that day there will be no hope for you. You know, the God who has made all things and has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ speaks to you actually right now and he calls out to you and says, you are not as good as you think that you are. You think you might be loving, but you don't know love the way that I do. My standard is perfection, inward and outward righteousness, and you will fail to meet that. But if you will receive my son today, and accept the fact that you are a rebel, and come for the forgiveness of your sins. You will never be turned away. You will have new life in Jesus Christ, and you will live in a way that you have never lived before, in peace and in truth and in grace. You know, for those of us who are brothers and sisters here, and we have known this kind of grace, what I want to say, it's not about how you are around other Christians that shows your Christianity clearly. It's how you are as a Christian around those who dislike you and make life hard for you that shows your true colors. People who you think are out to get you, people who are harsh with you, whether that's a spouse, a neighbor, a boss, a coworker, a mother-in-law, a child who is very difficult with you, or a child that you can only reach and talk to behind a plexiglass window because they're in prison. Whatever it is, the call to us is to love them and love them and so show and demonstrate that you really are children of your father who is in heaven who has done this for his enemies as well serve them practically just as god serves those his are his enemies practically by giving rain and sunshine to them give them the things that they need for life even though they might not deserve it from you and then pray for them and as you do so and you feel the joy of what it is like to be a teleos or complete and perfect person who is no disharmony in your soul because your insides and your outsides are matching, I pray that God will give you the joy that comes 
from being in his presence and being like him to a watching world. Church, let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much, God, for sending your own son to die on the cross for us and to love us and to show us in concrete detail just how costly sacrificial love was for you. God, there's no greater example than this. And I pray, oh God, that even if we should face incredible tragedy in our lives as well, if we end up one day grieving over the loss of children or seeing family members who are killed for the sake of the gospel or who are just killed, God, because of evil and injustice and our hearts are absolutely broken, if there are broken relationships we have in our lives, a God that causes us to cry and to weep, and we feel anger rising up inside of us, and this need, O oh God, to want to repay them evil, God, for evil, I pray, O oh God, you would break us and remind us that because you did not repay us evil for evil, O oh God, we are forgiven and saved. Lord God, I ask you to do a miraculous work in our heart, a work that no law can do, but a work that only the gospel can do. Give us new hearts, God, that love people, if there are any of those with broken relationships right now, oh God, who harbor hatred in their hearts, oh God, to their fellow human being, help us, oh God, to forgive, to repent, and to love as you have loved. So Lord Jesus, help us to be children of grace who love in an age of hatred. We pray this, oh God, in Jesus' mighty name.